Nadja Mschantaf und ich singe die Mimi. Ja, mein Name ist Günter Pappenden und ich singe die Rolle des Marcello. Ich heiße Vera Lotte und singe die Musetta. Hi Leute, ich bin Philipp Meierhöfer und singe Colleen. Die Oper La Bohème hat mit mir ein sehr enge Verhältnis mit meinen eigenen Lebenserfahrungen, da ich auch Musikstudent bin, wie mein Charakter schon nah. Und ich auch äh, allein in einer Großstadt ähm, meinen Studentenjahren gehabt habe, mit Freunden, die auch Künstler waren. Und äh, wir haben sehr viel Spaß gehabt und äh, sehr viel äh, Liebesabenteuer. Ja, als ich Student war, habe ich mir natürlich gewünscht, dass ich als Sänger Weltkarriere mache. Tja. <lacht> Liebelei als Studentin, dafür war unter anderem das Studium da. Nö. Nee. Dazu sage ich nichts. Doch, ich hatte ganz viele. Zum Glück keine katastrophale Ende haben wir erleben müssen, nicht so wie die Charakterin eben in der Oper. Aber, aber dieser ganze Bohem-Lifestyle, das, das kommt mir auch bekannt vor. Ich habe immer auf meine Stimme immer, geachtet. Immer, immer, ich habe nie immer. Party gemacht, nie. Aufstehen, keinen nie. Alkohol getrunken, nie nicht geraucht, nie ja. spät nein. ins Bett. Nein. Äh, Drogen, nein. Genau. nein. Das, war das, das war das Studentenleben ja, als ja. Sänger. Sehr diszipliniert. Ja. Die wahre Liebe gibt es in der Oper ziemlich häufig und im wahren Leben vielleicht nicht ganz so häufig. One of the biggest challenges uh, to do La Boheme is that you are confronted with an audience who are watching your production with memories, associations um, uh, or judgments of previous La Boheme productions in their head. So everyone thinks that's the Mimi that I love, that's the Rodolfo that I love, that's the Café Mormus that I love. And the challenge is not to destroy that for people, to say, that's irrelevant, uh, you know, the opera's about this, actually. Because with Puccini, as in his other operas, as in Tosca and as in Fanciulla, you really are confronted with a composer who is so aware of the theatrical possibilities of opera, who is so aware of writing into his music mise-en-scene, who articulates not just so many colloquialisms and everyday expressions and dialogues, but also directs you with the music. He gives you, someone says, I would like this glass, and then Puccini gives you three bars of not sung music, so the character can go and give that other character the glass or that object. Puccini shares with Janacek, And I think the two of them were, were very different in their uh, musical landscapes, the sound of the musical landscapes, but they share one very important uh, thing. And that is that they both listened to the rhythms of everyday dialogue and conversations, how people talk. And they took this and heightened it and, 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 and developed it and transformed it Uh, through song into something which sounds like conversation and dialogue, but isn't. And you are not even aware of it. it it's a genius. <laughs> the very first production I saw as an Australian student at the Komische Oper was Harry Cooper's legendary um, to this day, fantastic production of La Boheme. So as a student from Melbourne, um, I was in Berlin in the winter of 86, freezing cold snow, went through Checkpoint Charlie, seeing that there was a production at the Komische Oper, I really sort of knew that there was this famous guy called Harry Kupfer and was completely bowled over by my first Harry Cooper production, my first Komische Oper production, and the first time I'd seen La Boheme a few times before in Australia and in England. I'd seen maybe three productions before, but this was like watching something completely new because Harry understood, I think, how you have to direct Puccini and the emotional honesty 
uh, and the unsentimentality of it and the extraordinary sort of moving quality through the unsentimentality um, left a huge impression on me. If I imagined then that over 30 years later I would not just be directing uh, Love Away at the same theatre that I was sitting at then, but also running the Comish Opera, um, um, I would have laughed. And so it's a very special thing for me to be able to then do La Boheme on the same stage that I experienced Harry's production in the same week that he returns to the Opera House after so many years to direct um, a Handel opera, Poros with us, in the same week that we premiere uh, La Boheme. So I think the theatre gods have decided that this constellation of my production and Harry returning back to do a production of the Kumush Opera after nearly 20 years. Um, I think it's a good way to begin 2019. We are in, I believe, the world of the 20th century. The, prem the piece was premiered in 1896. It is not an opera of the 19th century. It is the first masterpiece of the 20th century. It has more in common with the psychological and emotional landscape of Wozzeck than it does with what happened in the 19th century. La Boheme is not Wozzeck in any shape or form, but the radical transforming of the architecture of music theatre and the way in which characters express themselves was opened, I believe, by Puccini with this piece. Even the opening few bars signal something which is unlike any opening of any 19th century Italian opera. Die Mimi ist meine Traumrolle. Ganz einfach. <lacht> Und ihr seid dabei. <lacht> Kitsch tatsächlich. Ich singe es jetzt zum zweiten Mal und äh, da ändert sich dann die Wahrnehmung. Inzwischen denke ich, es ist ein fantastisches Meisterwerk, was überhaupt nicht kitschig ist. I think Bohem is, an un, is one of the few successful attempts to really bottle and cultivate youthful vigor and energy and the, the, the creative energy of youth. And you think from the explosion of the first measures that eternally sound fresh. This music was new a hundred years ago and it will forever be new because it's, it's like the window into the imagination of a great creative mind. There's sparks flying and it's, it's you know, this kind of verve, youthful verve that he captures and that has a momentum through this entire piece is unbelievable. When you're young and you see it, you relate to it. That's me. She's me, I'm Mimi, I'm Rosetta, I'm Rodolfo, I'm Marcella, or I'm a bit like Colini, whatever, whoever you want to project onto. And then when you're older, you look at the piece as a memory, as something which happened, as something which is over, as something that passed, as a, as a, as a slightly hazy, not nostalgia, but as something that was about a lost youth, a lost time. So you watch it, but you experience it in a very different way, which is why young people love it and old people love it, and, and, and it has such an emotional uh, connection with a wide range of audiences. 
And essentially, for all the idea that the piece is about youth and the piece is about um, these young people finding their way through love, the, the basis of the, the, the opera is about death. It's about what happens when you are confronted with the first time, or for the first time, uh, with death. When it comes literally into the room. And it doesn't come in the shape of ghosts, like in the 18th and 19th century. It doesn't come in the shape of a long-suffering um, 19th century Verdian woman who must suffer or is compelled by sort of social or political forces or religious forces uh, to suffer and die. It's not the Wagner woman's death as male redemption. Nothing to do with this. Literally here is a cold room in which a woman who has been uh, for a few weeks living on the streets because she's been rejected by her latest lover, coming back to the room where she met this young man a year before to die in real time. Krank sein? Der Albtraum des Sängers. Steck mich ja nicht an. Steck mich ja nicht absagen. an. Genau, absagen. Hm. Hm. Albtraum, Terror. Äh. Meine Karriere ist vorbei. Wie soll ich sagen? Zweimal die Grippe hm. in einem Jahr? Ja. Oh. Antibiotika. Oh. Antibiotika. Oh, Gesund ein... singen kann jeder. Ja. Ohne ein bisschen Schnupf funktioniert meine Stimme überhaupt nicht. Ach so? Puccini as a theatrical composer had such amazing instincts that if you compare Butterfly, Turandot, Suor Angelica and Bohème, he actually, based on the material he had, created four entirely different theatrical languages. And the one of Bohème I find the most uh, captivating in that he found this kind of mixture of light lyricism and banality that it's almost half a conversation piece and the rest of it is not full-blown Italian lyricism. But here it's really this kind of intimacy, theatrical intimacy, that is so rare. You can see that he was influenced by the great French composers. Massonet has a stamp on this piece. I don't know if we'd have the first aria Michel without Manon, for example. Um, Falstaff, I think, had a big impact on the humor and the lightness that he's able to find because there's a great tr Italian tradition of this, but this has nothing to do with Rossini. This is coming from the school of Boito, of, of, of Verdi, and it's incredible. If you take the Benoit scene, so imagine, the, imagine how uh, every day a scene could you have. The landlord, you haven't paid rent, the landlord comes and knocks on the doors, you've been waiting for him to show up, like, damn it, today's the day. And everybody goes into a mad scuffle, we have That's opera music, that's, oh God, what the hell's gonna happen? It's chaos. And then what does he do from there? The kind of typical Puccini sleight of hand, only he could turn the temperature in the room totally different in, in, in two seconds. Marcia says, hola, date una sedia, presto, no. There's a charm to this music and they're saying, hey, sit down, have a drink, I gotta go. No, you don't have to go, sit around. How did he find such a charming way to capture something that's totally routine? I think that's the magic of Bohème that we forget is that it's actually not really an opera. It's like the greatest musical ever written. About the same time that the opera is set was the birth of the daguerreotype. The daguerreotype was the very earliest form of photography invented in Paris. It really then, of course, started the entire revolution of how human beings, the image of human beings, was represented two-dimensionally. So this capturing of a soul or this capturing of a memory. Uh, the production is not a documentary about 19th century French photographic techniques and it's not a, it's not a documentary about how to make daguerreotypes. But by making Marcello um, a photographer, it gives me a few moments where we can actually sort of feel, and the daguerreotypes are very beautiful because they actually fade. Uh, this process in which light and mercury and glass and silver um, sort of burn through, through natural light together, it was an extraordinary process. Uh, and of course, then they fade. And there's something very interesting about the idea of a two-dimensional, an object that was intended to, to capture memory fading as well. And there's something interesting about is the photo a capturing of the element of the soul at that moment. And this was the starting point for me. So we decided to place the production in a sort of 
very abstracted 19th century world with real people. We didn't want to make it historical. I'm not interested in historical realism. It's yesterday, this story. As in all my productions at the Commercial Opera, I create them for essentially my ensemble and the people here. And we have very long rehearsal times. In the case of La Boheme, we have eight weeks, which is a luxury in an opera house, to really investigate this piece and to go back to the score. La Boheme is the first opera I ever saw when I was very young. And it gave me a great love for opera. So I'm very glad to be a part of this cast. <laughs> that music my daughter wrote a song just like that the other day then you take okay sono andati the fourth uh, last hour of mimi so what do we have so another descending scale uh, how about musetas Same thing. This whole opera has the feeling of being a big improvisation because he actually, he, he didn't even really write a melody. It's almost, you're just spinning these thoughts out. And there's a, I think he learned a lot about this from Debussy. There were two composers that admired each other to a big degree. And you can see the kind of, apparently Debussy said to Defaya, who knows if it's true, that nobody captured the spirit of Paris in the 19th century better than Bohème and then Puccini in La Bohème. Oh, good. That's a good jump, Nadia. Good. So, super. Nadia, do that. Um, very good, sehr gut, meine Damen und Herren, Co-Solisten und Statisten, das ist, was ich brauche. We as conductors always talk about this idea of come scritto, do it as the piece is written, but really what that means is we do what we want and then we say, ah, oh, come on, this is what Puccini has said to do. But coming back to this piece in a new production and we take, take a scene like the, um, when Rodolfo and Mimi first meet each other that coming in there is a kind of unassumed quality compared to the entrance of Butterfly, you know? So operatic, unbelievably beautiful, but really beautifully sung, unbelievably lyric, but you know, you still feel where she's gonna be by the end of the first act. Then you come to Mimi. So here is sitting Rodolfo. His friends have gone to the bar already, and here he is saying, I gotta finish this article. I'll be there in a minute. He's got, he's looking for inspiration. Non sono in vena, he sings. There's a knock at the door. Chiela, scusi, una donna. A banal conversation happening above. Unbelievable music. The orchestra is already aware of something that they're not conscious of yet. It's a dialogue. It's a totally banal dialogue happening under this oh, only a kind of soupçon, just the air, the, the duft of this inspiration is already coming. And I think that's amazing that to come back to the score, next thing that happened. To make this romantic, I think, robs us of the the innocence, the kind of awkwardness of this first meeting. There's a poetic, casual character to this music that it's such a pleasure to come back and rediscover in the score. Schnell, ohne, ohne Verzögerung in den Dialog. Keine Overture, mm. Vollgas ins Drama. Was noch? Modern. 
Ja, das modern. Ja. We are used to terrible traditions and terrible routines in, in the performances of Lorraine, where there are ritadandos, where Puccini didn't want ritadandos, where there are rallentandos, where Puccini didn't want rallentandos, where it's forte, when Puccini wanted piano, just because the singers or the conductor want to stretch and pour or pour over the sort of score more rich, delicious bolognese sauce. And you know, that's my thing I say to the singers in the rehearsal. Boheme is not bolognese, it's also buco. You have to have the knocken, you have to have the bones, you have to have the marrow and the vegetables and the nice things in it, but it's also buco, it's not bolognese. And most bohemes that you experience in the theatre is it's oral bolognese. It's nice, but it's actually not what Puccini wrote. It's, he's very unsentimental. Uh, in Germany, of course, Puccini has the reputation for being sentimental. He's not. He's completely anti-sentimental. has nothing to do with sentimentality. Um, it's how the way it's performed, or how the way it's conducted, or how the way it's directed. So our challenge is to try and say, it's a great piece. You know this piece. Let's imagine that we want the audience to, to, as, to experience it as if they've never experienced before. And that's uh, a wonderful challenge to have. The third act is special. Because I think, again, Puccini comes down to, if you boil down, what is the nature of, you know? Which, by the way, breaks every rule of music. It's like power chords. This is the most simple means. It's just... That's, that's the whole nature of that music, but it's the idea of the heart in conflict with itself that pulses through this whole act. There's a momentum to the words, the end of this, that I think I find thrilling, the third act, to go through this, because we've kind of set the stage with the Jahrmarkt, with all of these sleights of hand we've seen up till now, and now it's time to get to the kind of, uh, you know, center of this drama, and he finds, again, a simplicity of means through the whole time. Themes sometimes don't develop at all. You hear the theme that accompanies Musette, it rarely develops. Mimi's theme develops. By the time you hear her coming in at the end, you know we're not where we began. But again, he does it with such a simplicity of means that it's almost disarming, that you, you don't realize that. He's taken away that barrier anymore between the subject and the treatment of that subject. It's just all in the air. My Hungarian grandmother, Magda Lövi, collected autographs and uh, went to Vienna every month to the opera also. And uh, I have a wonderful autograph collection which my grandmother gave me on my 18th birthday with extraordinary things in it. Letters from Bartok, um, Richard Strauss, Chaliapen, Maria Jeretza, um, Enrico Caruso, all the singers that were coming in and out of Budapest performing in concerts and opera. It's like a record of their time in Budapest. But the most prized possession of my grandmother's autograph collection was when she wrote, uh, as a young woman, to uh, Puccini for an autograph. Um, and he sent it back. Uh, what's amazing is that he sent it back uh, with a, his own handwritten envelope here, but also a photograph of him, which he has signed here, Giacomo Puccini, but his own signature, Madalena Lervi, my grandmother, Viareggio, 8th of October, 1924, Giacomo Puccini. Whether Puccini would be happy with my productions of his operas, who knows? Um, I don't really think about that, but it is, yeah, it's a very nice thing to hold in your hand, and he's sort of a guiding spirit to our production.